Okay, thank you for joining us for Proposal Writing 2, A Deeper Dive, which is a webinar hosted by IDEA, the International Diaspora Engagement Alliance, and the Foundation Center in Cleveland, Ohio. My name is Sarah Yusefnajad Gallagher, and I'm the Program Officer for IDEA. This webinar is part of our Capacity Development Series, and we're really uh, fortunate and excited to be partnering with a stellar organization like the Foundation Center again to bring this training to our members. One of the top requests we get from IDEA members is about how to seek funding for the work they're doing. And our last webinar, which some of you may have attended in the fall, was on proposal writing basics and was very popular. After that webinar, our members requested a more in-depth look at proposal writing and our friends at the Foundation Center agreed to come back and do another online training for us. So thank you very much to Carrie Miller and her team. We really appreciate it. Thank now, you. I'd like to form a... <laughs> Sorry, Carrie. Um, we're very pleased to have you. I just want to give a couple lines to introduce you so folks know who you are and where you're coming from, and then I'll turn it over to you. Um, so Carrie Miller is a Capacity and Leadership Development Manager at the Foundation Center in Cleveland, Ohio. She's responsible for designing, managing, and delivering in-person and virtual training programs to build the capacity of nonprofits around the country. Carrie has a master's in nonprofits, nonprofit management from Case Western Reserve University and a Bachelor of Science in History from the Ohio State University. So with that, I'll turn it over to Carrie. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you again. We, I'm really glad to be back. We appreciate the opportunity to do these trainings. So um, hopefully um, we'll have, get a lot of information out and have a lot of fun. Yay, because proposal writing can be fun. Um, so I am, as Sarah said, this is the second part of the second proposal writing course that we're doing. I'm going to go over some of the things that we covered in the last one, but I'm probably going to go over them fairly quickly and get into some of the, the deeper, meatier stuff um, that we, I want to get into. So that being said, too, if there are questions about some of the basic things that I may kind of speed through, I will direct you to uh, grantspace.org, which is a website managed by the Foundation Center, where you can access some free webinars on proposal writing that will be very similar to the last training we did. So I will um, get started and go through some of this. Again, if you have questions along the way, just type them into the chat box and we'll get to them as many as we can. I'm going to hopefully talk for about 40 to 45 minutes and then take time at the end to answer all the questions that you submit. I'll work on gauging the questions to, to make sure that we have time for them all. Um, so one of the things that um, we talked about the last time is where proposal writing fits into the grander scheme of your fundraising. Grand, grant writing and proposal writing foundation fundraising should just be one part of a larger fundraising plan that you're executing. So after you have done your research and found the grant, the foundations, the institutions that you want to submit to, you start working on the proposal. What I have up here on the screen is the outline for a template proposal that you can put together that can serve as the base for all of the other proposal writing that you do. So uh, when we do our proposal writing courses, we talk about a 10-page proposal Nobody asks for a 10-page proposal anymore. I'm not going to say nobody. I'm sure somebody does, but it happens very few and far between, and mostly for those significantly larger grants, the million-dollar grants, things like that. Then you may be submitting you know, to the Gates Foundation a 10-page proposal. But for a lot of the, the work that you are likely doing in, your, in, in the smaller organizations, you're not going to need a 10-page proposal. But putting that together will give you something to pull from. So as you begin finding new funding sources, new funding opportunities, you have something to work from and can turn those proposals around a bit quicker. And also make sure that you're having a consistent message across all of the proposals that you're submitting so that when funders talk to each other, and oftentimes they do, you know that you are sending the same message and, and presenting the same project. So this is these six things are the, the basics of what your proposal would be, the executive summary, your statement of need, the project description, budget, organization information, sustainability information in your closing, and the appendix. We're not going to talk about the budget either. I can also direct you to another free webinar from grant, um, that we host on Grantspace on the basics of budgeting for proposals. It's a great pro. It's a great webinar, and I would I would highly suggest it. And um, we can maybe work on that for the next one, but we're not going to talk about budgets 
really at all for this. Um, where I would suggest you start is in your need statement. And what we're really going to talk about a lot here is the logic model, which I just want to give you a glimpse of before we start going into the, the specifics of this so you can see kind of what we're working towards. This is a really great organizing tool. I, I will give the disclaimer that this is a fairly new uh, track that we're taking with our proposal writing courses. So you will see that we do suggest in some of our trainings that you do a, um, an outline or a logic model. So the logic model is really an important first step. It is part of the planning process. One of the things that this tool can help you with is bringing together different constituents, different voices, and different um, members of your team who are going to help you implement this project. Bring them all together and fill this out together so that you're all talking about the same thing. When you work in um, maybe larger organizations, there's often a conflict between the program and development staff because there's not an understanding of what either does. So <clears throat> the program staff will often feel like development is going off and writing these proposals of, for programs that they can't implement. This helps to mitigate some of that. It helps with communication. If you are an all-volunteer organization, this is a really great tool to bring your volunteers around so that you're all getting on the same page. You all have the same, again, you have the same message. So um, we're going to walk through each of these things, but um, really where you start, even with a logic model, is with your need statement. The need statement is what your community needs. This is not about your organization. This isn't what you need in order to get things done. This is about what is the issue in your community that um, you, your organization is addressing. So th this is answering the question of why the funder should care. What is it that's happening out there that the funder needs to know about, and and what is it about their mission that makes them makes them want to be aware of what you're doing? So, oftentimes with the the need statement, you really want to include statistics, and you want it to be um, very fact based. So, there's a I heard a funder say not too long ago that proposal writing is. 60% science and 40% art. This is the science part. This is where you really need to do your research, um, and in a more academic sense, do your research, and find out what's happening globally, locally, and you know, very close to your community that is causing, that is the root of the problems that your organization works in. You want to make sure that you're using the data that best supports the case you're building. So if you're working in homelessness, you don't want to say, you don't want the only focus of the information that you're providing in the need statement to be national. You want to be able to say, you know, the national rate of homelessness um, in minority communities is X percent. In our community, the rate of homelessness in minority populations is even greater. Um, and, you know, there are things that have been done to address this issue, but it's still a problem that we, our organization is working in. You want to make sure that you are presenting the need statement that fits the scale and scope of the work that you're doing. So if you're not working nationally, you don't want the information just to be focused on a national level. So um, you want to make sure that you are bringing it down to your local level. And this is going to be everything that comes next is going to feed from the need statement. So this is really the thesis, the main part of your uh, uh, proposal that's setting the stage for everything that is to come. You, there, there's a little bit of a nuance here. You want to make sure that you are presenting this as a true need. You know, if if you're saying that, oh, in our neighborhood of the you know 100,000 people that live in our neighborhood, two people are homeless. That's really bad. But is that something that you need to be applying you know fifty thousand dollars to a foundation for? I, I don't mean to be flip about that, but I just want to, to present that that is not necessarily the, the scope that a funder would look for. So you want to make sure that you are, you are presenting this in a way that makes the funder understand if there are, if there are two people homeless in your, your community, but that's out of 10 people, that's a significant problem. So you want to make sure that you are presenting it in, in that way. But you want to make sure that you're giving the reader hope. You don't want to say that, 
you know, homelessness is something that is taking over our community and people who, you know, face these issues see no end and we don't know what to do. And, and you want to make sure that you're, you're providing hope because you want to make sure that the funder is going to feel like there is, there's going to be purpose and impact in the dollars that they invest. You want to make sure that you're linking the solution to the problem that you're describing. So um, if you say that we have, um, you know, a 5% homelessness rate among minority communities in the greater Cleveland area, I use a lot of Cleveland examples, um, it has been shown around the country that when you provide people permanent or semi-permanent housing, that alleviates the rates of homelessness in communities by a, a significant amount. You're presenting, you're presenting that connection to how you plan to address the issue. Um, on the one hand, on the other hand, you want to make sure that you're avoiding circular reasoning. So circular reasoning is when you say the problem in our community is that there is no pool, so we want to build a pool. Well, you're not really presenting what the you're presenting the lack of something, but you're not necessarily presenting the need for something. What is what is happening as a result of there not being a pool. Um, you want to make sure that you're really providing um, a good, a good um, case for your, your work. And you would just want to make sure that you, you are specific. In the need statement, you are demonstrating that you understand the problem, that the issue is of importance to the community, not just to you, but of the community, that the scale of the problem is solvable, and that this is this is your your lead. This is your hook. This is where you are making the reader want to learn more, read more about the solution to the problem. So you really want to make sure that you are investing in that. And going back to our needs, our logic model, you can see at the very top, that's where your need statement. That is the overarching of everything that's going to come is from your need statement. So. Um, in the logic model, you're going to want a sentence or two, and you, you're going to want to say, um, you know, homelessness is at X percent rate in our community, providing permanent or semi-permanent housing for the homeless population alleviates homelessness by X percent. That's our need statement. We're, we are identifying the root. We're saying that homelessness is a problem because people don't have a home. In your need statement, you when you in your narrative piece, you can talk about you know, how it shows that when people do have semi-permanent, permanent housing, they can, it's easier for them to find jobs, it's easier for them to hold jobs, things like that. But for your logic model, you can just sort of put that overarching piece. Um, so then you're, you want to start thinking about your goals. So what, what is it that you want to do through this, this program or project that you're proposing? Do you want to alleviate homelessness? Is that what your organization's working towards? Is that your mission? Your goal statement is a little bit more aligned with the big picture, the big ideas around your mission statement, and this is just showing how this project's going to fit within your mission statement. So um, it, there's an organization locally here in Cleveland whose mission statement is not to end homelessness, but it works, to, it works towards providing um, affordable housing for all residents of greater Cleveland. So there is a connection between alleviating some of the homelessness issues with providing affordable housing. So they can say, you know, our goal with this project is to provide affordable housing to homeless populations in order for them to succeed and um, become active in the community. And, and that sort of is that big picture thing that they want to accomplish. So um, now we're going to get into, now that you sort of have those big pieces that are going to be the underlying part of your logic model and your project, th th those are the things that are going to be the driving force of everything you do from here on in in your logic model. So you want to make sure you get those, those down. So in the logic model, um, I am going to define some of these things um, before we start thinking about putting putting things, filling this out. So um, you have your need statement. We're working with homelessness. I'm just going to stick with that as the example. And then you have some assumptions. 
this this is thinking about the environment that you're working in and and what are some of the things that are external to your organization, external to your project, that are going to influence your ability and the outcome, the ability to do the project and the outcomes that you'll see in this project. So, you know, if I'm thinking about homelessness and I'm thinking about some of the, the larger things, larger factors at play in our community, what are some of those things that, that are happening? It could be that... Um, you know, there has been an increase in awareness of the homeless population in the greater Cleveland area, which is what makes this a good project for us to be thinking about right now. It could be that the um, homeless population is increasing at a rate that is is not good for our community. It, no rate is good for the community, but there's a significant increase over the past period of time that makes now the right time to be talking about this issue. Um, Maybe it could be even broader than that. Maybe there is a new program through HUD, Housing and Urban Development, you know, the department at the federal level where there are new guidelines that have been put out that make this now a possibility. So what are some of those things that are happening external to the work that you're doing that are influencing your ability to do this project? So th those are just things that you want to be aware of because the logic model is going to set you up all of – all of the pieces in the logic model are all of the pieces that you're going to put in your proposal, but also recognizing that your proposal is something that sets you up for um, managing and uh, monitoring and evaluating your project after you get the grant. So these are all tied together. These are things that are all linked. So you want to make sure that as you're putting your logic model together, as you're putting your program together and your project together, you're thinking about what the outcomes are that you're going to be measuring after you implement this, and your assumptions are going to speak to that. So if one of your outcomes is that you're going to be able to recruit, you know, an increased number of volunteers, you're going to be able to recruit 500 volunteers to help with this project, the assumption is that because there's an increased awareness about the homelessness population, you're going to be able to reach more people. Well, at the end, if you see that um, the awareness was not as deep as you thought it was and that people, you were only able to recruit 200 volunteers, you can go back to that assumption and say, you know what, this is where we, we were under the impression that the community was, and that was not the case, which is why we were not able to reach this this outcome, to get to this outcome. So you want to make sure that you're thinking about all the things that that are in place in your community, all the things that you need to be in place in your community in order to be successful. So I should have talked more about evaluation in the, in the front end, too, but this also just sets you up for, for your evaluation. So just to define some of these things that are here. So we talked about the need statement. We talked about the assumptions. The inputs, these are the things that you need in order to run the activities. So these can be human, financial, organizational, community resources, and um, these also include things that could influence your ability to do the program. So um, if you're running an after-school program and you are doing this in a church basement and the church has a community dinner every Tuesday night, that may not make your, um, you may not be able to have your after school program on Tuesday night. So you would include that in here, again, just so that you are thinking through all of the pieces of your program, you are presenting to a funder all of the things that may be challenges to your program, so that when you go to report, they're not asking why you don't have this after school program on Tuesday nights. Um, your activities, these are what you do to address your need. The outputs are the things that are produced because you provided that service or activity. So your outputs are direct, um, direct results of the activities. The objectives are how the people you are serving will be affected. So um, these, this is going to be a little bit more narrow. You're starting to now really talk specifically about your community and about the constituents that you have. And your outcomes, these are broader, longer-term change. So these are changes in attitude, behavior, skill, status, or level of functioning. Those are the main areas in which we're going to be measuring change. And then the um, goals and impact. Oh, the, I'm sorry, the outcomes 
are short-term and long-term. So the short-term results are things that you expect to see and achieve in a one to three years, and the long-term are changes that you hope to see in four to six years. Um, so you can see on here you have your objectives, your short-term outcomes, and your long-term outcomes. And then the goals and the, or the impact, this is the big picture. So we talked a little bit about the goals. Impact is another word for that. Um, this is the big picture of what is being accomplished. These are typically organizational, community, or system level changes that um, are often very difficult to measure but are important parts of this process. So you want to make sure that you're thinking about what is the big picture, what is the, the ultimate impact. The ultimate impact is going to be that we are going to de decrease the homeless population by, you know, completely. We're going to end homelessness in our community. You want to make sure you're being realistic. End homelessness in our community and um, change people's opinions of homeless populations so they'll be more prone to help people who find themselves in those situations in the future. So that's um, attitude and behavior. So um, the key evaluation questions that you're going to want to look at as you um, go through this, because you want to make sure, again, you want to make sure that you're building this into the, the process. So your evaluation questions are things like, um, you know, surveys. Are you going to do surveys? And then what are you going to ask in those surveys? Are you going to say that we're going to build permanent housing for people, and is that going to be measured by rent? So how many people are paying rent? How many people are finding jobs? How many people are, you know, whatever, again, those, those outcomes are, those skills, behavior, attitude, status, or level of functioning, what are those and, and how are you going to measure that at the end? And then when you start talking about reporting and coming back to this afterwards, were your assumptions correct? Were there other things that prohibited the, an the anticipated outcomes? What were some things that came up that you did not think were going to be um, a problem and then ended up being a challenge in the end? So you want to make sure you're thinking about that as well. Um, so I just want to make sure I'm getting everything. Um, so this is the logic model. This is your organizing tool. From here, you can just go back to this. You go back to here, and you have a lot of your, your proposal done, your statement of need. We talked about that. I would spend a lot of time on that in the beginning. Your project description is all of this. Your project description is your you know, inputs, outputs, objectives, short-term outcomes, and long-term outcomes. What is it that you're going to be doing? What do you want as the result of, of those activities? That's what your project description is all made of. Those are your methods. Those are, that's how you're going to get the work done. So you want to make sure that you are um, putting in a lot in there to, to make sure you're doing that. I do want to spend another minute talking about methods, and in part this is important as we think about the relationship between um, objectives and methods. So for objectives, what we talked about in the definitions, objectives are how the people you are serving will be affected. So this is going to be things like 75% um, of people that we put into homes are going to stay there, are going to be able to maintain that rent for at least one year. Um, eighty percent of the people that we put into homes are going to find a job within the first six months. You want your objectives to be smart, so they're uh, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time bound. That's the acronym SMART, um, and those are those are increases in um, those are incremental changes in behavior and attitude. The methods are how you are going to get there. So if you're going to say if you're saying that the ultimate outcome that we hope to see through this program that we want to deliver, the ultimate outcome is that um, we decrease uh, the homeless population. So my short-term outcome is that we're going to decrease the homeless population by 50% in the first three years. How am I going to get there? Well, we're going to um, – 75% of people that we place into homes are going to be able to pay rent for at least one year. 80% of the people that we put into homes are going to be able to find a job in the first six months of living there. How am I, My methods are how I'm going to do that. 
So I'm going to raise money to um, build a dorm-like place for people to live. I'm going to provide social services by partnering with these various safety net organizations in my community to provide services to support the people, the residents of this dorm. I'm going to have weekly check-ins to make sure that people are on path. When they're not on path, we come up with um, individual uh, plans for them to make sure that they get back on, on track. Who's going to be doing those? We're going to hire, you know, five social workers to work with these people. How many people are going to be living in this dorm? All of those things, those are all your methods. Um, and some of those will fall in various places here. Obviously, activities um, is what you're doing. Some of those are inputs. If you are, if you're going to build a dorm, part of what you need as your inputs is a capital campaign, is a dormitory. Um, those are things that you need to put into, the resources that you need to put into this project in order for it to be successful and in order for you to do the activities. You can look at your logic model. I, I apologize if I'm going a little bit quickly here. You can look at your logic models as, you, as a series of if-then questions. If we run a capital campaign, then we can build a dormitory. If we build a dormitory, then we can reach this target audience and provide homes for them. If we reach this target audience, then we, if we reach, and, and you want to put exact numbers here, if we reach 100 people, we can provide them homes. If we reach 100 people, 75% or 75 of them will stay in those and be able to pay rent for a year. If they pay rent for a year, they will be, um, we will have decreased, we'll be able to reach half of the homeless population and, and provide homes for them in the first one to three years. And then my long-term outcome, if we provide homes for 50% of the, of the homeless population in our community for one to three years, then in the long term, in four to seven years, we're going to be able to accomplish this with the entire homeless population in our community. So you want to you wanna think about these as being all connected. So, um, so as I mentioned before, too, your logic model is going to help set you up for your evaluation. So after you do all of this with your proposal, you submit all of this, all of this is in, and you get the grant, um, then you're going to need to be doing reporting on that grant. Um, it, there's monitoring and there's evaluation. Those are two different things. The monitoring is the ongoing oversight of the program. So this is um, the extent to which the inputs, outputs, and timetable are proceeding according to plan. So these are things that you are going to be doing from the moment you start the project all the way through its end. If it never ends, then you never end that monitoring. Um, and if there's something that's not working as according to plan through the monitoring, you're able to see that, catch that early on, and maybe change your course. Excuse me, evaluation is the process that determines the outcome and impact of the program as systematically and objectively as possible. So this is, these are the tools that you use to evaluate the success. So the monitoring is, is um, the monitoring are things that you're going to think about for your inputs and outputs. That's how you're going to measure your inputs and outputs. Those are, those are your process pieces. Those are the things that you're saying, am I on track with my capital campaign to build my dormitory? Am I on track with my recruitment to get 100, 100 homeless uh, families, people into the dormitory in this given time? Your um, evaluation is then going to be your outcomes and your objectives. You know, are people, you know, changing their behavior, changing their attitude? How are you measuring that? You're often measuring that through satisfaction surveys, through things where you are um, – getting feedback directly from the participants. The, that first part, the inputs and outputs with the monitoring are things that you typically get feedback from your staff, from the people who are implementing. The um, evaluation is when you're getting feedback from the constituents that you're serving. Um, so just a little note, the funders, many funders will often work with you to help you set up evaluation plans and I'm using evaluation um, somewhat generically there because that's the monitoring and the evaluation. Um, 
So you want to make sure that you're putting, you're relying on your funder. The other, the other thing that you want to do in all of this, um, and in the previous training, in the previous webinar, we talked about building relationships with funders and the importance of doing that. Part of why that is important is because of this, because it will, um, they will be helpful to you. So. The other reason why it is important to build a relationship with the funders is because you want to make sure that you are being open and honest, and that way when your project may not go as planned, you can have that conversation with that funder, and you can talk about what you learned from the experience, how you incorporate that learning back into the program to make it better for next time. That's really what a funder is looking for. If the program doesn't work the way you thought it would, if maybe there were some assumptions that you didn't take into account or assumptions that you thought were there but weren't there, when you have that relationship with a funder, even if you don't, but it's, it's a little bit more comfortable when you do have that relationship with a funder, you can um, have that conversation with them and let them know how are you going to incorporate that learning back into the program. That's the most important part. Um, how we know what we know is as important as what we know. So when you this goes, this is very specific to evaluation. Um, how you gather your information is just as important as what the outcome of that of, uh, gathering is. So um, we will talk a little bit more about some ways to to gather that information. Um, how do you know that the people are changing as a result of your inter intervention? Funders are requiring more and more intricate evaluation of the programs to measure impact, which is, again, while they work with you because they funders have their own missions that they are trying to fulfill. They just need other people to help them fulfill it. So they need to collect that information from you to understand why, how they are, help, they are filling their, their mission. Um, so some of the ways that you can gather this information. We talked a little bit about... Um, some of these already, the process evaluation, did you say what you were going to do with the money? Inputs and outputs. You said you were going to host five community meetings. Did you host five community meetings? You said 100 people were going to show up. Did 100 people show up? Um, satisfaction evaluation. This is, these are qualitative measures. This is where you're sending out a survey and people are self-reporting. So they're saying, oh, yes, I, you know, we, I attended five smoking cessation trainings and I have you know, decrease the amount of I smoke by X percent or I quit smoking for six months. Um, outcome evaluation, this is where you're measuring the process as well as the outcomes that happen as a result of the process. So, uh, you know, you have your inputs, you have your outputs, and you have your outcomes. This is, you're, you're measuring that whole process. Um, and then the efficiency. This is a more internal organizational look, but this is where you are saying, okay, we did this capital campaign to raise these dollars. We built this dormitory. We recruited 100 people to live in the dormitory. Did we, did we spend that money wisely? Was that the best use? How, you know, how did we do in, in our work in order to do that? Do we have enough staff? Do we have too much staff? What, you know, this is making sure that you're spending the dollars appropriately in the way that you said you would be spending them both on the project but also within your organization. So again, I know I'm going through some of this stuff fairly quickly, but um, you are getting just the overview of the logic model and the role it can play. The next part of your um, proposal that you're going to want to think about is sustainability. So you've talked about your need statement. You've talked about your project description, which is your logic model. You want to talk a little bit about sustainability, which is how you are going to sustain the project over time. This is, you know, do you have other funders who are already interested? Do you know, have a list of funders who might be interested in your doing the due diligence to um, get them the information? So you want to make sure that um, you're thinking through what your fundraising and, and sustainability plan is. And then you want to think about your executive summary. This is a really important part of your proposal. This is, as it sounds, it's a summary of everything you just put together. It goes on top of your proposal. And it is, um, some funders will look at this and, and make their determination as to whether you're a good fit for their organization because it gives them the high-level look at what your organization is proposing to do. 
and they can see very quickly, oh, we're a foundation that focuses primarily on education. I'm not really seeing the link to education in this brief synopsis that they're giving me. So you want to make sure that you are making the link to the funder um, as soon as you, you do your executive, within your executive summary. The executive summary leads to the letter of intent, or the letter of inquiry you might hear. More and more funders are going to this as a first step in the relationship with the foundation. So the letter of inquiry is basically your executive summary that you submit to a funder so that they can make that determination if you're a good fit for their foundation before you have to go through the process of doing a whole proposal. Although you know we've given you the structure, this is the basic framework for what funders are going to be looking for, and I, I mentioned before this is based on a 10-page proposal. Um, you funders don't want to make you go through all that work to tailor it to them if you're not going to be a good fit. So you will um, submit an LOI, which is typically a one to two page letter. You will you can use your um, executive summary to be the basis for that that proposal, that LOI, and then. Um, you'll submit that, and they will let you know if they want you to submit a full proposal that is that much more that goes much more in depth into um, how you're going to do what you're going to do, the project description, all of those different pieces. So you want to make sure that you spend some time working on that. It's basically a mini proposal. Um, so trying to get through some of this. So the other thing that more and more funders are doing is going to online applications, which many of you have already probably encountered at some point. I was fortunate enough uh, last the end of last year to sit through a seminar on that was given on e-proposals, e-grant proposals, by somebody who developed the software for foundations for that submission process. Um, and it was, it was very eye-opening. It seems like it is a really great thing. It makes things a lot easier. There's less paper. You know, you have a little bit more time to do things. Electronic reporting makes things easier to compile the information. There are some cons to it as well. <clears throat> From the funder perspective, it allows for hard deadlines and it keeps the human element out of it. So, you know, a funder will say this is due at 5 p.m. Previously, when they would receive a handwritten or a typed proposal packet at 5.02, they would have to make that decision. It, it sort of alleviates that for them. It, it makes it a little bit more pragmatic. Um, it also, and this is, this is where it is a con for, to a certain extent, for the proposal writer, is that it allows for the funder to manipulate and stack the data in ways that you may not be prepared for. So they may be looking at mission statements side by side. You may think that, you know, in your need statement, there's one sentence that flows into the next sentence, while the funder may split those sentences apart for comparison's sake, and it may not be presented in the way that you anticipated. So there are some challenges. You want to make sure that you're being very clear, concise in all of your writing for e-grants. Um, some of the other pros is that you can work on it from anywhere. Um, a little bit more economical, you have access 24 hours a day, multiple people can access easy file uploads and less hassle and delivery, some of the cons. There are a lot of technical issues. One of the biggest frustrations in doing online proposals is character counts, that um, you, know, you are limited in the amount of characters, not words, the number of characters that you can use in the fields that are provided. Um, if you're using Microsoft Word, one of the things I learned that I had no idea of before, Microsoft Word puts in invisible characters. So you may be doing something in Microsoft Word and you should definitely be using a word processor before and cutting and pasting into your um, online proposal. But if you're doing that, uh, Microsoft Word may say that you have 300 characters, which is your limit. When you cut and paste it, it may be 315. And you've got to figure out how to take out those 15 characters. Um, the tip there is to make sure that you're doing this in a plain text pr word processor so that it's in, in rich text so that you're, you're not having any of those invisible characters and it will cut and paste much more easily. You can't use indentations. You can't use special characters. Um, so if you're doing a hyphen, 
um, you want to make sure that you're just using the one dash hyphen instead of the two dash hyphen. Some programs are incompatible with word processing, so you just want to make sure you are doing that correctly. You can't control the format. Most of the time it's black and white, so you can't include colors and charts. It's pretty standard, so you don't have any creative presentation or individualization that may make your proposal stand out. The fonts and font sizes may be uniform. You can't insert tables and bullet points. So there is some uniformity to it that if you're used to you know, sort of sticking out with your proposals, it may be a bit of a challenge. Um, funders can change the questions along the way. So even after your proposal has been submitted, a funder may decide that they want to ask the question differently, and they can change the question. So, you know, you want to make sure that you're paying attention all the way through the deadline, even if you are one of the few people who get it in early. Um, and you can't always save it. And if you do have multiple people working on it, it's hard to get one voice. So there are some challenges in doing online applications just to be aware of. The last thing I'm going to talk about, and then we'll get into some questions, is um, some general tips for proposal writing. The way, you know, we talk a lot about the format and the structure, but um, historically we haven't talked a lot about the, the writing of the proposal. Um, so you want to make sure that, you know, remember that you're in control of what you put on the page. So you want to make sure you're putting your best self forward and you're putting the information that makes the most sense. Um, good writing is expected um, and important. Good grammar is expected and important. But you, the key is making sure that you're finding the right fit. You want to make sure that you're applying to an, a foundation that is interested in what you're funding, what you're interested in, is working in the same geographic area, and will provide the type of funding that you're searching for. You want to make sure you're focusing on one thing throughout. You don't want to ask for a variety of different things a variety of different programs. You don't want to casually reference another program that you do without explaining it. Um, I would I would hesitate in casually referencing another program just in general. Um, you want to be direct. You want to ask for the, the amount that you're asking for up front in the first paragraph. You say, we are writing to make sure, or we are writing this foundation for this amount of money for this project. Um, you want to be positive and action-oriented and tell a story. Uh, that's, think about what makes you interested in reading something, and that's what's going to make somebody else interested. You don't want to be uh, too dire and put a bad picture. You want to make sure you're giving the reader hope. Um, answer the question of so what, why should I care, and that sounds somewhat harsh, but that's really what you need to get across in your proposal. Um, I keep going back to this concept of, finding the right fit, you're not going to change a funder's mind. If you are an educator, if you're doing a project on homelessness and you apply to a foundation whose main focus is education and you say, but we're working with those kids in those schools and that's important to their education, their focus is education. It's not giving people homes. And so you're not going to, you're not going to change that funder's mind. Um, you want to make sure that you're getting as close to the funder's mission from the very beginning as possible. And your goal as the writer is to walk the funder to the fit and, and make sure you're showing them why you, you are there, why you're applying to them. You want to show that you know what you're talking about. That's very important in your need statement, that you understand your constituents and that you know, you know what the real, the root of the cause, uh, the, I'm sorry, the cause of the problems are. Um, you want to make sure everything matches. This is a big red flag for a funder. Um, if you're, project description, doesn't match your logic model, doesn't match your budget, that's a big red flag for a funder. So when you look at your logic model and you see inputs and um, you say that you are going to have, you know, five staff members, you're going to have this office space, you're going to have a fundraiser, you're going to have all of these resources from the community, and then in your budget you say, well, we're only applying, we're, you know, we only need one person, one staff person. That doesn't match. The funder wants to make, wants to know where those other four staff people are. Um, you want to make sure that you're representing your constituency correctly. I'm sorry, I'm looking at my notes to make sure I get everything. 
Um, you want to make sure that you're not raising questions that you're not answering. This goes back to your need statement and presenting the scope of the work that you're doing. So, you know, if you are, again, talking about the homeless community and you say, you know, another problem in the homeless community is food deserts. Well, you're not working in food deserts, and you're not going to be talking about food deserts again, so you don't want to raise that as a problem in your need statement and not address it later on. Um, and you want to avoid soft language. You need to sell the funder on your vision. And when you th say things like, we might do this, maybe we can, we would, we could, hopefully we'll get 100 families, that's not instilling confidence that you can, you're the organization to do the job. So you want to make sure that those are the things that you're getting across to the funder. I flew through that, and I know there are probably a lot of questions. So um, I, the the last couple of slides are really just on packaging. Um, I'm, I will direct you to the other um, training, the free training on grant space for that, and I'm going to turn it back over to Sarah, who is going to let me know what the questions are. That was a lot of information all at once, I know. It was, but it was really good information. And I think a lot of it is gonna be new um, to the folks who are on this call, because as we discussed before, this isn't information that people generally get when they're uh, thinking about grant writing and um, even doing trainings for that. So thank you for diving in so deep to some of the, the things that funders really do care about um, that we wouldn't necessarily think to put in a proposal. There are a slew of questions. So let me see if we can um, bang through a few of these fairly quickly. So um, one question on the logic model was, for the example you provided, is it specific to certain types of organizations, or would you say that that's a logic model that can be used by anyone? This is a logic model that can be used by anyone. Um, I will also say there are a couple of different ways of doing this, a logic model. The Kellogg Foundation, where you can find this at wkkf.org. They have a whole 70 page booklet on logic models. So you can, you know, you can go there and see some other examples. Really though, the reason I chose this one is because this provides all of the pieces for your proposal as well. So really if you're, when you're using the logic model as an organizing tool for your proposal, this can be used for anything. Great, thank you. And um, there was a question about capacity development grants or organizational strengthening. Um, Leo was saying that this doesn't seem to be a common option for organizations. Can you speak to um, you know the sort of availability of funders who fund this kind of work and maybe what the proposal writing requirements, like what might be different or how you might adjust your logic model or the other pieces that you're including um, to feed that kind um, of proposal? Yes. So capacity support, uh, we also call it administrative operational support. It's very difficult to come by. Um, but you you can create a more competitive proposal um, when you do use this kind of logic model for that. And really, so instead of your need statement is still not about the organization. Your need statement is still about the community you serve and what you're applying for is your ability to serve that community better. And you're serving that community better by, you know, if you're doing a drug rehab program, you're doing that, you're serving that community better by providing more counselors, by providing one-on-one -on -one support as opposed to one to 20 support. Um, so you, you want to make sure you're framing your request in that way. It's not just about we need more staff so that we can do more work. It is we need more staff because homelessness has become such a problem in our community that our current capacity is m only meeting the same level of need that we've been meeting for the past five years while the homelessness population has increased by 10%. So, you know, in order to meet the demands of the community, we need more people. And you also don't want to say, so there, there's another little trick in there, and I know that a lot of the information that I give is sometimes conflicting, but it speaks to some of the nuances that you need to consider. So you don't want to say, well, if you've been doing this work for 10 years or for 50 years or whatever, why is the homelessness population still growing? So you need to make sure that you're thinking about those questions. You also need to think about, you know, is if the issue's not going away. So why should I keep putting more money to that? You know, you need to be able to show in your in a capacity proposal how the work that you have done has made an improvement in the community, 
but, you know, again, this, so this then speaks to the assumptions. What is it, it that's happening in the environment? What are some of the, the things that are outside of the organization's control that are happening that are causing this problem to increase? Maybe it's that the work that you, that you have provided housing for 100 families over the past three years, but, you know, the steel plant down the street just closed, and that created a huge influx of, you know, people who are now homeless. Or maybe you've had such great success with this population that you want to expand your services to now address the needs of families. So you, you need to be able to make sure you're answering some of those questions. As to where to find those people, it, you know, it's those funders who are interested in that. It's just about doing the research. Foundation Directory Online, which is a foundation center database, which has more funding sources than uh, many other databases I've, I've ever encountered. Um, you can find that information there. If you go to grantspace.org, um, if you go into the Find Us page, you can find where you can access that database for free. So um, those, are, those are some of the tools and resources that you can use to find some of those funders. Thank you. And I think the one other aspect to capacity funding um, is, I don't know if you find this as well, Carrie, is if the specific thing you're asking for will create some sort of sustainability for your longer term capacity. So it's not just there's an increased need and we need more staff, but how will that particular staff person um, you know, build, build the actual like sort of long-term capacity of your organization. So I think people should be prepared to talk about that. Definitely. Um, someone asked, Nancy asks if, about documentation to apply and be competitive for funding, particularly um, in the U.S. if the organization is international. So this, the organization she's thinking of is based in Haiti and they're working towards development in Haiti. Can you speak a little bit to that? Um, so there are a couple of nuances, and, and um, I would be more than happy to answer that question in particular offline just because there's a lot more information there um, and questions I would have as to, you know, are you a um, – I'm going to blank on the, on the terminology because I put all the international stuff on my head for a minute. Are you working with a U.S. organization or foundation already? Do you have the equivalency determination to receive funding from U.S. foundations? There are a bunch of things, um, a bunch of steps to take before being able to provide um, that information to a foundation. A lot of it centers around an affidavit that you have to work with uh, an attorney, and I do believe it has to be an attorney in the States um, in order to obtain that so that you can show a funder that you are equivalent to a charity, a U.S. charity. So there's there's a bunch of steps there. Again, I'm going to direct you to grant space as well. If you go under the knowledge section, uh, I think it's knowledge base, um, you can type in international fundraising and find some articles and some things that will help you better understand international fundraising. Great, thank you. And um, I think we can, we'll can we provide some uh, follow-up resources and contact info in the email for people who, um, like Nancy, who might want to discuss this more. Yeah. Um, how long should a, a good executive summary be? An, an executive summary should be one page. That is what you should aim for. If it's a page and a half, okay, it should be one page. Um, I had a grant writer tell me once that she tries to start every paragraph Every new section of her proposal, she tries to start with a really strong sentence, and then she takes that sentence and basically just uses that in her executive summary. It should be very short. The letter of inquiry or the letter of intent, that can be more like one to three pages, but your executive summary should be one page. Great. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, can you... Well, can you speak to open windows for submitting proposals? Um, is this different for all funders, and where might you find this information? Um, you can go to the funder's website. You can go to Foundation Directory online. I'll point you there again. Um, but if, you're, if you don't have access to that for whatever reason, you can go to a funder's website and find out what the deadlines are. Um, and more and more, again, as the move to the e-grants has sped up, the deadlines have also kind of gone away a little bit. So there's a lot more foundations that do have rolling deadlines. Um, 
I think that you should think about if there is a funder that does not have a deadline, you would have to think about what that means for your program. If I'm looking to start something, an after-school program for the next academic year, so right now I should be fundraising, I should be submitting the proposal in January for the program that I want to start in September. Outside of that, you do want to make sure that you're thinking about your overall calendar year and where the, some of those deadlines that do exist fit. So if, if there's a deadline in April and the board meeting for that foundation is in May and then you find out eight weeks after that board meeting, you could submit April 1st and not find out until the you know August 1st as to whether or not you even got it. That's not even including check in hand. So you do want to make sure you're thinking about and paying attention to some of those deadlines. But any funder on their website um, who's accepting applications will have a specific deadline as to when they're due, or they will have, you know, no deadline. Excellent. And um, several people, there are a variety of questions about how to find funders and specific things about different funders who would be good for funding international work or, or different things. So I'm just putting the link to um, grantspace.org in the chat box. And I'm also putting the link to um, the foundation, uh, what is it called, the directory? Foundation, yeah, directory, the foundation online, directory online. In the chat box. So folks can check those out there. There are, I think some, some of your guys' resources are free and some of them are subscription-based. Is that right? I'm sorry. Yes, some of it is subscription-based. There are some free searches you can do as well. Okay, excellent. Um, someone asked about uh, maybe another question on the resources you guys have. Do you have budget templates on Foundation Center or on yes. Grantspace? So the other, thing, the other thing um, on Grantspace, when you go, I'm sorry, I'm just going to look up very quickly and make sure I'm sending you to the right tab here. When you go to grantspace.org and you look under the tools section, tools is where you'll find knowledge base, where you can type in a question um, and you'll get a lot of answers, a lot of answers, and there'll be articles and definitions and things like that. There's also a, a link under there, under the tools tab for sample documents. That's where you can look at um, proposals that have been um, awarded, and there'll also be budgets there as well. There's also LOIs and, and other things like that that you can look at as examples of some of the things that have been funded. That's great. Thank you. I've just um, pasted that link in the chat box as well for folks who want to refer to that. Mm -hmm. um, Another question about Foundation Center. Are you or any of the other staff there available for direct consulting, or is this is it all online resources? Uh, it's primarily online resources. If you are in one of the five cities in which we're located, Cleveland, New York, D.C., Atlanta, or San Francisco, there are um, librarians who are in the libraries who can answer questions for you and provide some tutorials. But as far as things like, you know, we don't really have anybody who will read a proposal and give feedback, who will look at a budget and give feedback. We don't, we don't do that. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, and if we can fit in two more, and these are the last sure, two. Not a problem, um, yeah. So um, a lot of funders ask the question about other funding being committed for the program or project. Um, mm -hmm. So do you have any advice on how to answer this question? I guess maybe the, um, the implied thing is that there might not be other funding. Uh, committed already for the project. So do you have any suggestions for that situation? Yeah, so when you when you do your budget and when you, if you look at samples, you'll see some of this. They'll, you know, a lot of funders will provide a format that they want you to use. It's like an Excel document or something and they'll have three different columns. So it'll say on the it'll have I'm sorry, four columns. The far left column will be, you know, personnel, all of the listings of things that you'll be listing expenses and income for, um, personnel, printing, transportation, all this stuff on the far left column. And then the next column will say, you know, total needed for project. Then the next column will say amount requested from this funder, and then the next will say amount requested from other funders. So that's how you can think a little bit about how you present your sustainability question so that when... If you encounter a funder who doesn't you know, pay for administrative costs, you want to make sure in your budget you're still listing administrative costs, 
but you want to show that you're asking for those expenses to be covered by a different funder and that you would leave that, you know, when it says amount requested from this funder, you leave that blank. Amount requested from another funder, then you fill that in. Um, so that that's one way to think about how you do, how you can present some of that. If there are no other funders, I would encourage you to at least think about other people who might be interested in funding this and including them in explaining it. A funder doesn't necessarily need you to have all the other money in place before they'll give you the dollars, but they do want to know that you're thinking about it and that you're thinking about how you are going to pay for this program in its entirety and how you're going to sustain it over time. The other thing with, with that is um, when you are building a relationship with a funder and you have these conversations and then you submit and you've submitted to five different funders and of course, especially after this training, all of them are going to say yes. And so you call that funder that you have the best relationship with and say, you know what, we submitted pro proposals for $50,000. We only need the $20,000, but everybody came through. Here's, here's what I'm thinking about with your proposal. You were, for, you were gracious enough to grant us a gift. Um, we could either expand the number of people that we reach. We can put that money, you know, we can earmark that money to extend the program for next year. Whatever that plan is, whatever it is you think is best to do with that, you then have that conversation with the funder. Gotcha. That makes sense. Um, and the last question is about online applications, or I guess others um, as well. When several months have passed since you've submitted an application and you haven't heard anything back, what's the best way to follow up with the funder? Um, pick up the phone and call them. At most... I would say 75, 80% of funders, you should be able to pick up the phone and call. There are obviously those that say, do not call us. If you call us, we will never answer our phone, all of these things. Maybe you don't call those people. But for the most part, particularly after you have submitted something, it is completely appropriate for you to call that funder and ask you know, if they've gotten everything, if they have any questions, or you know where they are in their process, because you know it is their that's their job. Perfect. So, yeah. Well, um, I think we'll stop there because we're a few minutes over. Carrie, thank you so much again for joining us and and giving us not only the the first webinar on the proposal writing basics, but this deeper dive. Um, everyone's been asking for the recording for both, so I think this has been a really valuable training for our members, and we really appreciate you joining us to, Great. to provide this info. Um, just for everyone else, I'll be sending out the slides, recording, and the um, some of the links we talked about, as well as the template for the, uh, for the logic model later this week, so stay tuned for that. Thanks again, Carrie, and everyone have a great afternoon. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.